Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part three for this news bulletin, the final report for today, Wednesday, October 31st, 2012. I'm Darko, my website is ggnonline.com, and on YouTube, ddarko2012, and my backup channel is ddarko2013. You can check out all these uh, stories I'm covering in YouTube's video description, all the headlines and links will be posted there. All right, we left off with Myanmar and talking about their puppet, um, this uh, Miss Key. Uh, but it's basically a uh, British educated and stuff like that. So, but she's a philanthropist, uh, you know, so to say. She, you know, she's there for Western interests and stuff like that. And she's ignoring what's going on, which is these Muslims facing a food and medicine crisis. Uh, also, they're being targeted, right? They're being targeted, and uh, they're, they're doing nothing about it. Also, you have these uh, Buddhist monks, innocent Buddhist monks, praying for genocide. It says real monks don't do politics. The venerable Rira through front left leads a rally for political prisoners loyal to Aung San Suu Kyi's pro democracy movement in March 2012. It says the monk himself has often been trained as an activist monk and a political prisoner who spent years in prison. In reality, he was arrested for his role in violent sectarian clashes in 2003, while Suu Kyi's pro democracy front says here is actually U.S. funded sedition. So it says here he has picked up right where he left off in 2003 and is now leading the anti-Muslim rallies across the country. So here's an alleged monk carrying an umbrella with uh, the Sang Su Kyi's image on it. These so-called monks have played a central role in building Su Kyi's political machine, as well as maintaining over a decade of genocidal sectarian violence aimed at Myanmar's ethnic minorities Another example of U.S. democracy promotion and tax dollars at work. And while a U.N. report says Myanmar's opium production has increased for the sixth successive year, this uh, dam, which is a latest achievement of operational capability, was successfully blocked by the development of Myanmar's infrastructure by halting a joint China-Myanmar dam project that would have provided thousands of jobs, electricity, a state revenue, flood control, uh, enhance river navigation for millions. So it goes on here and says Su Kai and supporting her network of NGOs as well as armed militants in Myanmar's northern province conducted a coordinated campaign exploding both environmental and human rights concerns and the reality. Uh, it goes on here and it says that this is a picture of the dam on its way to being the 15th largest world until construction was halted in September by a campaign led by Wall Street puppet Su Kai and a stable of U.S. funded NGOs and a terrorist campaign executed by armed groups operating in Myanmar. But just like Afghanistan, the opium and poppy uh, seed production is up at record levels. Then in Haiti, Haitians urge president to resign over U.S. citizenship. I'm sure that's just one of the reasons why. Uh, because, well, let's see. He never called out the Western powers for taking advantage of the um, hurricane crisis including the spreading of cholera that was brought by UN troops, uh, the raping of their people, even their men, by the troops, uh, the vaccination of their people that's going to, of course, bring out eugenics. Uh, they never really helped them. None of the aid actually went to the Haitian people. None of the real infrastructure has ever even helped them. One and two years uh, past this uh, hurricane, they, people still are living without houses or anything. And this individual right here was an owner of a nightclub. He was very close with police and military. He was a Western chill and a good little fascist. But hundreds of Haitians taken to the streets in the capital, Port au Prince, to call on the president uh, of the nation to step down. So it coincided with the 25th anniversary of the country's constitution. They criticized him for holding citizenship both in Haiti and the U.S., while the Haitian constitution does not recognize dual nationality for senior government officials, kind of like with a lot of these politicians in the U.S., Washington, that have dual citizenship, mostly with Israel. Martelli, a businessman and former folk singer known by his stage name Sweet Mickey, was sworn in as president in 2011. And, of course, they could have tried to get the um, uh, artist I think his name was, in there. And they didn't want him. He was still in exile in Africa. Middle class protests put Chinese government on the edge. So I just covered this article recently, Asia Australia. It's talking about the Australian school children having to learn an Asian language under the ambitious plan by dictator Julia Gillard to prepare the nation for the Asian century. So it says, remember, Gillard has committed this 
reaching goal over the next 13 years delighted to tighten links with Asia and to ensure that Australians are able to exploit the region's staggering growth. Well, what are they talking about? They're talking about the unstoppable rise of Asia and its massive new urban middle class was a transformation as profound as any that have defined Australia throughout the history. In other words, know who your masters are. So as a victory by protesters against the expansion of a chemical plant proves a new rule in China that the uh, government is scared of middle class rebellion and will give in if the demonstrators' aims are limited and not openly political. They say it's the result of the past decade's economic boom. The protests underscore the challenge the incoming leaders face in governing an increasingly wealthy and wired population who are growing more assertive. Democratic movements in places such as South Korea and Taiwan started with the middle class, and in Taiwan's case, environmental issues feature prominently, which is why they're trying to destroy the middle class here in the United States. All right, on China. China government thinks, uh, think tank says zap one kid policy. The group urges an end to all birth limitations by 2020. It's a bold move for a group so close to China's leadership, but some say that the timeline isn't aggressive enough. Talking about a plan going nationwide by 2015, followed by a drop of all child limitation policies by 2020. China has paid huge political and social costs for the policy, as it has resulted in social conflict, high administrative costs, and led indirectly to a longer-term gender imbalance at the birth. And I think it's actually led to something, this is my own little theory, about these uh, rash of knife attacks by young men in preschools. I don't know what it is, but it's. I think it has some kind of. It's some kind of eugenics blowback. Some speculate that the policy's demise is impending, as China is undergoing a rare transition in leadership. So, however, this uh, Hu Jintao, who just recently, you know, they said he's got a lot of money, a lot of cash. His family has said that China would keep up its policy until 2015. So he's a good little sellout. Then Christian Bale honors. Chen uh, Guan Chen, this is the blind activist, denounces forced abortion in China. So then on Thursday, the actor Christian Bale presented blind forced abortion opponent with an award at the annual Gala of Human Rights First. So he was under a house arrest um, and Bale attempted to visit Chen but was roughed up by thugs who prevented him from visiting the village. Bale said at the time, what I really wanted to do was to shake the man's hand and say thank you and tell him what an inspiration he is. Bale also stated, that uh, Chen had exposed a program of forced abortion and sterilization in Shedong. A program of forced abortion means that women are being dragged from their homes against their will. They're being forced to have abortion, sometimes late term. Imagine that, while with some women reportedly dying in the process. He says this is a true horror, and if in an insane world, this man Chen, who is helping these women, who is living by some of the most simple, brave, and universally admired values that we teach our children, uh, for this, this man was imprisoned and beaten for over four years. So, you know, Christian Bale, he was there at the Colorado shootings. A, a, he's a pretty upstanding dude. Um, and I've covered this article before. Think again at China's military. It's not time to panic yet. And why was that? Because of the um, one, one child policy and all the males that it was producing. China's one child uh, generation will weaken its military. They uh, call these, it says here, a widely perceived as creating a generation of spoiled, overweight boys dubbed little emperors, so who are uh, doted on by four grandparents while their parents toil to support them in fields, factories, and offices. So, um, actually, I remember covering an article. I couldn't find it ever again, but it was a Chinese general saying and admitting that the that the uh, Chinese soldiers need to harden up a little bit more. So it could be a reason for why the Chinese government, or at least their think tank that's close to the government um, is actually considering ending the one-child policy for strategic defense purposes. Either way, China versus America, World War I style or type shadow war looms over East Asia. So as tensions in East Asia grow, driven by conflicts over islands, China's rising power and renewed U.S. role in the region, some find the situation disturbingly reminiscent of Europe in the 1910s. The question is asked, could the region be drawn into a wider war? or will trade and economic interdependence keep them in place? Of course, this is all done. This is from this is a good website, Global Research. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's part of globalization. Is That's how the powers that be get every, all these countries um, on board. And, you know, they do what they have to do. They do what they're told. Like, the you know, that uh, the leader of China that I was just talking about, the millionaire or billionaire. 
even if their people don't want these policies, they'll still push them. You know, because it's like, oh, China, you want to get built up? I'm sure that's what, you know, Nixon and ty different types of people like Kissinger and all of them, globalists, basically, were saying, well, you know, it's China. If you want an economy, you got to enforce these sterilizations and forced abortions. Oh, okay. In fact, we know that's happening because I covered a Land Destroyer Report article on that that was based off um, uh, Africa. It was all about Africa and how they were talking about how they would have to sign on to these programs and limit their numbers in order to maintain economic relations and trade agreements that they are binding to. So they're talking about the surging nationalism in East and Southeast Asia stirred by territorial disputes, which is all provocateur and intensified by the Chinese regime, is seen by some scholars as similar to the situation of Europe before World War I. In particular, the rise of China is singled out as the most uncertain element of regional security. Washington is shifting resources to the Asia-Pacific region to maintain its influence in the economically booming area and to keep China uh, its biggest potential challenger in check. And following that article, ex-envoy accuses U.S. of agitating China-Japan tensions. The U.S. is doing whatever it can to crush China's rise and maintain global hegemony, hegemony Sorry, even if it means stoking conflict. So the retired dipl uh, diplomat, uh, Jian, who served under Secretary General of the United Nations and China's ambassador to Japan reports in the New York Times criticized Washington for fermenting conflict in Asia over conflicting territorial claims over various islands and sea lanes instead of pressing for di diplomacy. So it's kind of like with the EU, like they created that whole economic Eurozone thing to not just consolidate, but to, but to prop up the petrodollar in the West after they raped and pillaged uh, over there with the dollar. Um, so it could be that this whole thing with the territory dispute with Japan now all of a sudden um, formally uh, buying it, um, what was it, from a private investor or holder, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. They had already had it, um, but all of a sudden it gives the U.S. to say, oh, we better go over there and make sure everything's okay, right? It allows them that in, that presence. The U.S. role in this and various other Asian territorial disputes is not one of a neutral player trying to avoid escalation. Rather, the U.S. has pursued an aggressive posture of expanding military assets in the region so and teaming up with China's neighbor, which is Japan. And Japan says, I do not, or they say, I do not see Japan making any concessions. I do not see either side making concessions. Commander I's Army troop rotations in Asia Pacific from the 23rd of this month as operations draw down in Afghanistan. The senior Army commander in Asia Pacific says he looks forward to opportunities to begin the 30 to 45 day rotational deployments that will enable soldiers to train with their counterparts throughout the region. So there you go. And they're already building up with drones and stuff. U.S. aid spying in Latin America. Just briefly, in Latin America, U.S. aid has long earned a reputation of an organization whose offices are, in fact, intelligence centers scheming to undermine legitimate governments in a number of countries, continents, countries. The truth that U.S. aid hosts CIA and U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency operatives is not deeply hidden, as those seem to have played a role in every Latin American coup providing financial, technical, ideological support to their oppositions. Then USAID and CIA are supporting dictators and stifling democracy in an exclusive interview. They've been expelled from Russia because of the government's opinion they attempted to influence the internal political process. And this is what we're talking about. Russia accuses USAID of trying to sway elections. This is after the decision to end the U.S. Agency for International Development, her regime change, uh, two decades of work in Russia by saying Wednesday that the agency was using its money to influence the election. A claim the U.S. denied. Western observers criticized Ukraine parliamentary election. Well, why? Because they didn't get their puppet. It's funny because they didn't get their puppet out there in Georgia, too. The pro-Russian guy got in there. Official said 60% of the ballots counted for the ruling pro-Russian party of the regions. Earlier in the day, observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe condemned the elections. It says Vladimir Putin is the new global Shah of oil. So their Exxon is no longer the number one oil producer as of last week. It belongs to Putin Oil Corps. It says the title belongs to Rosenneft, Russia's state-controlled oil company. And Rosenneft is buying TNKBP, which is a vertically integrated oil company co-owned by British oil firm BP and a group of Russian billionaires. Russians say they distrust authorities and protesters alike. 
Russia is unlikely to see a change in government anytime soon, either through the electoral system or protest-driven overthrow. Experts presented three scenarios for the change of power in Russia. Massive civil disobedience, its consequences are unpredictable, voluntary changes by the state, and rapid degradation of the population extinction of the nation. Thank you.